We love to hear from our clients and our uh, listeners. And today we have a great listener and uh, client that's joining us, Dr. Steve Hershchak, an anesthesiologist in Chicago. He's been a client of ours at Life Benefits for a number of years. And we're just excited to have you, uh, Dr. Steve. Thanks for joining the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's so rewarding to hear the stories of our clients and how managing money a little bit different the way we do with the life insurance that we use um, and how it's changed their life, how it's uh, given them different opportunities or helped them in different times where uh, traditional methods just wouldn't have cut it. So we're going to explore some of those today with you and how you've used your life insurance policies and like I said, how many years has it been now since uh, you've been a client, Dr. Steve? Yeah, you know what? I'd have to count exactly, but I, I think you're probably probably close to 10, I would say. I was thinking that, too. I, did we meet first no. in Chicago when we were doing that uh, meeting there, or did, had we met before that and you came yeah. to the meeting? I can't yeah. remember. I think I knew you. I think I knew you a couple, two or three years before that, even. Okay, so yeah, it's been a good. It's been a good yeah. ten years or more. So yeah. that's cool. I think that meeting would have been 2011, 2012, somewhere in there. Yeah. yeah so okay. time flies. So those of you that are listening, that are clients, and get our uh, newsletter, uh, Doctor Steve was uh, 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 featured in our clients uh, in the Living Richly newsletter. Uh, yeah, that was back in July 2018. So if you have uh, if you've read that issue, if you haven't read that issue, you can always contact our office. We'll be happy to send you a copy of it. But today, let's uh, talk a little bit about life insurance and how you've used it as a financial tool, Doctor Steve. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my interest in life insurance, I should say, my first exposure came when I first left medical school, first left residency, and we saw a financial advisor, probably twenty plus years ago, and he recommended, you know, putting away money into various mutual funds, pretty significant sums for each of our children, and I just thought, gosh, if, if I fund that much into my college funds, I, I don't know if there will be any money left over to do anything else with, and and then he, he had me buy a 20-year term policy and said, this is what would take care of your family, you know, in case something happens to you, and I just, that was the last thought I ever gave to the word insurance, and I honestly, for the next 10 years, could not tell you how term insurance was different from whole life. I just gave it no thought. Mm. And then I stumbled upon a book called, um, it was by Nelson Nash, something about the, the banking, infinite banking, or something along those lines. And I've always been kind of an out-of-the-box thinker, a little bit of a contrarian. And, and that concept of growing my own pool of money, uh, building my own bank, so to speak, really intrigued me. And so I read more, and I think that's how I kind of stumbled on on you, Tom, and your story, and life benefits, and your family, and then we engaged, and you helped me understand even further. So I really became intrigued with this idea of how I can take income of mine and direct it into a financial product that uh, has guaranteed growth. It has an instant um, financial protection for my family if I pass sooner than I'm, you know, sooner in life. But most importantly for me, it has an, uh, an accessible pool of capital because mm. I, I'm disciplined and I'll de delay gratification, but I really wanted something I could use now. And most people, when you say life insurance, you think, oh, that's for like, you know, people I love after I die. Well, you at Life Benefits was talking about using it as building a bank, so to speak, of capital that you could use now. And so I had one office building at this time of, of and then when I say off square, I don't mean like some 10 story glass and steel structure, but we bought an old house in Rockford that was a very, very nice home on a busy intersection and that it got converted into an office building. And so we kind of chopped up the bedrooms and living rooms and things into offices. Mm -hmm. And this concept, we stumbled on it over 15 years ago. We, we took this house and turned it into a, a, a building that now has 15 private office suites. Mm. and create an incredible flow of cash. And, and we kind of got the idea about this. And I thought, wow, this is really tremendous. And this would be a great thing to do maybe over and over. And mm -hmm. so we got back from a year on the mission field in 2015. We, we went to Honduras for a year, and, and, and my wife served as a teacher, and I served as an anesthesiologist in a wonderful Christian 
hospital on the northern yeah. coast of Honduras. I, I remember reading about that in the uh, newsletter. Yeah, and, and we lived off of our recurring income, but we got back from Honduras, and I really wanted to do more uh, commercial real estate. And there were these two really ugly office buildings that had been empty for four years before we went to Honduras. And I brought my wife through, and I said, you know, if these buildings are empty when we get back, from Honduras, I said, well, we should probably buy them. And Andrea kind of rolled her eyes because they look bad. <laughs> and people would drive and buy them. I mean, I'm just telling you, like, you had to have real vision to see anything in them. You know, I mean, there were raccoons living in the attic. You know, there were birds. Oh, my the goodness. Bad. Um, but, I'm, you know, I'm a visionary, and, and, and I just saw potential. They had some neat architectural features. And so we came back from Honduras, and I, I made an offer on these buildings, and we bought them for a very, very good price. You know, the bank was asking... I think the, they were valued at like 400000 at one point. The bank was trying to get one hundred and eighty or 200000 And I made an offer for like 80000 or $70,000. And, you know, the realtor looked at me like, are you serious? And I said, look, Mike, I said, banks don't want empty office buildings. And this bank has been holding this empty office building for five years. That's so yeah. true. So yes. we bought it. We bought the building. And you know what I was able to buy it with? Well, I was able to use this pile of cash that I accumulated in my whole life insurance policy. Cool. And this is what, when the light really came on for me is, wow, like this is what I can use whole life insurance for. Like I like hands-on investing, and not everybody does, um, but I really like hands-on investing. I like buying distressed properties because I can put uh, my love into them and TLC and to a team of people build them back. And so we bought these two old buildings, and we fixed them up, and I think there's a picture of the before and after in, our, in the newsletter you guys yes. did back in 2018. And, you know, these buildings have been full now for three or four years, and I think they create mm. four or $5,000 a month of cash flow. That's you cool. Know, and I did this, and so I bought them with my whole life policy, mm -hmm. and then we rehabbed them with cash that we had in the whole life policy. Um, and so that's one thing I really appreciate about whole life insurance as a financial vehicle. Yeah. And, and, and once they're full, uh, did you have to continue using the capital from your whole life insurance policies or was the bank willing to look at refinancing those? Yeah, so that's a great question. So once the buildings were full of tenants and they were stabilized, that's the term the banks use is it stabilized. So I had good tenants. Mm -hmm. They were now in there now for maybe almost a year. And I went to the bank and I said, hey, I'd like to uh, refinance this now. And, and I had now pulled just about everything I owned in my life insurance, I think, and then some. I, I completely was leveraged up. I used all my life insurance money. And the bank, you know, sent out the appraisers. We reappraised them. And they appraised for, for more than I had into them. So now I got to get this check back from the bank. Mm -hmm. And with the check, I paid off my life insurance. So I put all the money back. And now we own these buildings. That How was cool is that? The income. Yeah, that's so cool. And, and I'll bet it was a better interest rate than it was on your policy loans too, right? In the the environment. Well, it actually was. It, it was, yeah. Yeah. And and I know there's some confusion about that that you need to take the money out of your own policy, and I didn't because money is really just a commodity, right? I mean, a dollar from the bank is not going to be different than a dollar from your policy. So money is a commodity. So you buy money. At the cheapest place you can get it, you know. Obviously, consider your terms mm -hmm. and all the you know documentation. But yeah, so the bank gave me a better loan mm -hmm. um, than my policy would. So I just use whoever's going to give me the cheapest source of money. Exactly. Exactly, and that was that was very wise to do that. That's such a great illustration of a point that we often talk about because, like you said, you know, people do think that they well maybe I have to take the policy loan because it's there. Well, in your case, you know, you wouldn't have necessarily been able to buy the building right away without the policies loans. But then once you've got it cash flowing everything, now the bank's ready to look at it and they give you a better deal on it. That's so cool. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I think if I tried to go about this with normal financing, the bank would have said, well, let's see your taxes from last year. Well, last year I didn't make a lot of money because I lived in Honduras that year. I didn't go mm -hmm. any anesthesia services, so our income went way down. Mm -hmm. And that would have raised a lot of eyebrows with the bank. And I may not have ever been able to purchase these buildings. So that's why, you know, a few years ago, I was going for my morning prayer walk. And I was just reflecting on just the blessings of uh, in my life. And I thought, and I was just so grateful for the McPhee family and for the attention and care that you guys give to me and helping me get the policy created and, and keep it in force. 
because that allowed me to buy these buildings, rehab the buildings, to now own the buildings full of tenants, creating income. And I thought, how was I able to do all that? I was able to do all that because I put money in a financial product that you helped me understand. You designed it in a specific way that I learned most um, brokers will not write a policy that way because you don't get very good commissions that way. But you did it that way for me to help me create this pool of capital. And I was just so grateful for that. And I thought, this is really incredible. Uh, I've got this growing uh, financial product. I now own these office buildings. And I thought, let's do it again. Let's, mm -hmm. let's do this again. So we, we created more policies and we looked for more buildings. That is so awesome. Dr. Steve, you know, um, over the years, we've shared uh, different um, ideas around surrounding our faith and money. And I know that uh, we have both looked at what we've been taught in, in our faith about having too much money might be a bad thing or managing the money we have and all those things. Can you discuss a little bit about the things that we've talked about and struggled with to make sure that, hey, it's okay to have money as long as we're using it for the right purposes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, first of all, money is a tool. And money is something that we all have to deal with, like it or not. Money is how we um, shelter ourselves, put food on the table. And so we all have to handle money. And it takes money to do almost anything in this world, whether you're running non for profit missions hospitals or you're trying to take care of your family or a business or you have to have money. And so God gives us different amounts of money to be stewards of. And I do believe what the Bible talks about is whoever is faithful with little, God will reward with more. Mm -hmm. And so I see money as a stewardship, just like the use of your time, the use of your, your intellect, your skills, the things you own. Um, it's how you're stewarding these things. And money, I will say, is one thing, though, that I think those who accumulate money, you have to be very, very careful. Money can become what we would call an idol. Yes. It can kind of become your main value in life, where everything that you do is evaluated on, is it growing my value, is it growing my money? Well, that would be money um, occupying a too important place in your life. I'd call that an idol. And so that's where my faith is really important, that I can see money as a gift, from God. It's a stewardship that I'm responsible for, but it's not my God. Mm -hmm. God is my God. God is the source mm -hmm. of my joy, my strength, my provision, my redemption. He is the one who gives my life meaning, but he gives me the joy of creating businesses and assets that create more money, but then he's always going to watch what I'm going to do with that money. Mm -hmm. Am I being faithful with that money? And I think the stories of the talents and the minas in Matthew 25 and Luke 19 talks about the uh, the the money that's given to us or entrusted to us is based on on our ability in the story in Matthew 25 in Luke 19 it's just given you know 10 minutes which is about four months of wages one minute is and what those stewards did with that money gave them different responsibilities in the future the story in Matthew they were put over managing things uh, lots more uh, resource and lots more materials and the story in Luke it actually gave them a position of influence because they were then directed to take care of cities or populations or people so I think the way that we manage our money also helps us influence other people as well as being given more to take care of yeah I think you're right I think it absolutely, it absolutely can be that yeah well, there was a trauma that took place in your life uh, not too long ago, and uh, uh, hopefully none of our listeners ever have to go through what you have, uh, have gone through. Fortunately, um, the lives of all your loved ones were safe, but tell us a little bit about that trauma. Yeah, last spring, May 8th, actually, I was sitting in my house uh, looking out the front lawn, out the window, and I saw black smoke coming across the front yard, and I thought, that's really a weird color of smoke, and I ran out the front door and kind of followed the smoke around, and I saw the garage was on fire, a massive in fire, like an inferno, and mm. I, my truck had caught on fire in the garage, mm. and by the time I got back into the house, the whole house, my wife had opened the door to the garage because she saw smoke coming in the home, and we didn't know where our 15-year-old son was, and so she thought, oh my gosh, she's standing in the garage, so she opened the door, and 
fire just engulfed the home within probably 30 to 60 seconds. Oh, my. The home was full of smoke and heat and fire. We didn't have much time to get out. But fortunately, by the grace of God, I didn't lose any children or anybody got, nobody got hurt. What a blessing. You know, we lost all of our material possessions that, you know, two of my kids ran out without shoes. But, um, you know, the house burned down, and these are the storms of life that are going to come to everybody. And, and they do come, and some people have had much harder years than we've had. Um, but you know what? God is faithful through the trials. He said he will be with us in the storms of life. He doesn't necessarily shield us from the storms of life, but he's with us in the storms. And so the Hershek family got to be on the receiving end of incredible generosity from so many, many people. And it was one of the most humbling experiences that we've ever gone through in our lives. People gave generously to us in ways that it was truly, truly humbling. And I, I hope nobody has to experience what we did, but I'll tell you what, um, wow, we just saw just the goodness of the church, the local church, and our neighbors, and people who just really came out and helped us. That is just incredible story. And how did your life insurance policies uh, affect any of that? Did Were they something that um, played a role in that at all? or, or did You know you, what, Tom, they, they absolutely can. Right now, all my life insurance dollars just about are being spoken because we've continued to buy old office buildings, and we bought five really run-down buildings two years ago, and they're almost... They're about 80% rented and about 95% rehabbed, and I'm just about at that point now where we are ready to do it again, and we're going to call the banker over and walk through it and get an appraisal, and I hope that they'll all appraise for above and beyond what we put into them, and I'll be able to put that money back into our policies, and what would be wonderful, Tom, is we are going to be short some money to finish our house uh, mm -hmm. because of the lumber prices and things this past year was absolutely crazy, so our house went way over... Um, yeah. policy limits. Um, and so um, we're, I'm, what I would like to be able to do is get this capital back there and, as you just said, use it as a source of money to help us finish building our house. Yes. Cool. All right. That, that's neat. That's neat. So obviously, you know, with the house and everything, that's, that's amazing how the, the Lord was guiding you through during that process. Uh, that sounds like Horrible, something horrible. I hope no one ever has to go through it that's listening to this. But it, it's nice that um, it didn't completely devastate all areas of your life because you had you had reserves, you had things going in other places as well. Oh, that's absolutely right. I tell you, um, <laughs> even little things. I went to the I went to work the next day, opened my locker, and I thought, wow, I have a pair of prods in my water bottles here. <laughs> like I just like <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was just little things, but. Yeah. But joking aside, it was wonderful to have insurance policies that were not in my house. They're somewhere in a cloud somewhere. You know, they exist. My buildings existed. Like, all these things kept going. You know, my grandma was a refugee from World War II, and she used to point her head and say, Stephen, what you have up here, no one can take from you, because the communists chased her out of the Poland in World War II, and she realized the only thing you can keep with you also is, you know, what is what you know in your brain. And so you're right. You, you don't lose everything when all your physical things are gone. Yeah. And, and I'm so glad your family was safe throughout the process. So that's, that, that, is, that is wonderful. So a couple of years ago, Michelle and I were um, allowed to enter Cuba and walk the streets of communist Cuba. And I was appalled at what is not available in the grocery stores. There'll be a line of, you know, 50 people waiting to get in line to maybe – maybe get five chickens that are in the in the uh in the glass enclosure there or the bread lines go around the block and um you mentioned your grandmother talking about communism well, what do you feel about what is happening today in our society about the marxist theology that's being teach taught mm. well it's certainly nothing new under the sun um, it's been, you know, utopia-type societies have been tried for ages, and I don't know of one that has succeeded. And um, it's very concerning when people start to think they can get something for nothing, and unfortunately our government, I think, um, strengthens that belief by just sending money into our checking accounts that comes from just 
digits on a computer that somehow you can create money in thin air that sends a very, very dangerous message to people. You know, value is created when you serve people, when you think, mm-hmm. when you work hard, when you take risks. That's how you make society better in one way, and then you create value. Um, and so these utopian societies, when you look at North Korea, and you look at Cuba, you look at Venezuela, I just don't know how people can be so easily deceived to think that, you know, we can create these things and we can make it work this time. Mm-hmm. Well, that's really, really true. And, and I think that um, everyone listening today, uh, if this is the take-home message that you take home from this, uh, this interview with Dr. Herschak, is that he saved, he put aside a percentage of what he was earning for many years so that he had the opportunity to take advantage of these buildings that he is rehabbing, that he would have the advantage of having resources to finish building his house, that he had the resources to take a sabbatical and go to serve on the mission field. If we don't take the time to set apart part of what God has given us in a place that's guaranteed to grow and be there for us when opportunity knocks, then opportunity is never going to knock. Mm-hmm. And we can't expect someone right. else to take care of us. Yeah, that's true. That's right. Hey, hey, I have a question for you going back to your real estate um, investments yeah. for a little bit. A lot of people are excited about investing in real estate. And they think maybe they need to go pay a guru to take some course in real estate investing and a lot of them, you know, we see them take these courses and then they never really end up doing anything with it. Um, in your in your experience, you know, is that is that a wise step or is there a way to learn about, you know, investing in some of the commercial real estate that you've done without taking all the guru courses that may or may not help? Yeah, great question. You know, in, investing in your education, I think, is almost always a good thing to do. Like I would I would say, you know, put the money down, go to the seminar, buy the book, get the tape, listen to the podcast, always good things to do. But, but eventually you gotta, you got to put it into action, you know, mm-hmm. analysis, paralysis. You can't just gather data forever. So eventually you have to decide, you know, what is my uh, investment vehicle going to be for real estate? Do you like the idea of a single-family home? Do you like the idea of multi-family homes, like apartment buildings, duplexes? Do you like the idea of, of uh, like small commercial buildings, perhaps, or big commercial buildings? And through looking at all the different things available, I really, you know, I read uh, some great books years ago, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cash Flow Quadrant, some of Robert Kiyosaki stuff on real estate. Mm-hmm. I kind of understood how to make money work for me. Yeah. And I decided I was going to do this. And I had a little construction background. I used to be an electrician back in the day. So I was familiar with a little bit of the building process. And I drifted to commercial properties. It just seemed to, I just like the idea. I have friends, dear friends, who buy residential homes and they make a wonderful ROI. Mm-hmm. And other people do multifamily. So I would say start small, but buy something. Put your, get in the game, put your money, get some skin in the game, but start small because you're going to make mistakes and mistakes are okay. That's how you learn. So just make the mistakes smaller and make them controllable. But I would say if you want to learn the most about if investment real estate can work for you, do your reading because you got to pay the price. There's sure. knowledge you have to gain in anything you do. So pay the price, you know, go to the course, read the book, but then eventually pull the trigger and buy something. Because once you buy something, the whole thing goes up another level and you <laughs> engage in it another level. Yeah, then, totally. Oh my gosh, don't worry about the emotions that come the night before you close. I felt physically sick. <laughs> I, I, so I, we found this old building and I talked my wife into like buying it and, and I went out to, we went to Applebee's and we got this little corner booth I remember our kids were little and I'm like I think we should buy this I added up all the rents I said here's what the rents are going to be if all the tenants stay and here's what our mortgage will be and here's what the taxes will be and here's what the utilities will be and, and you know I, I did my best job to sell my wife on something I knew nothing about <laughs> but you know she went with it but I'll tell you what the night before we were going to close I felt physically sick. I thought, what am I doing? I thought, oh my gosh, what am I doing? And by the way, I couldn't get a loan. I went to bank after bank and they turned me down. And they said, what do you know about commercial real estate? And of course, the answer is nothing. I read a few books. Well, <laughs> my wife said, well, I guess this, this, this is a closed door. I said, no, it's not a closed door. You know, Robert Kiyosaki says, you have to keep going. There's more than one bank in town. I said, we're going to go to all of them. Mm. And so on my post call days, I'll get my suit on. I'd, you know, wipe the sleep out of my eyes from being in the hospital, and I'd go knock on the doors at banks, and I'd talk to them. 
But you know what I do? Every bank I'd go to, I'd find out why they rejected me, and then I would speak to that, like, preventatively in the next presentation. Mm-hmm. Until finally, I found three banks that were willing to give me a loan. Mm-hmm. And they had to, like, fight for my business. So that was wonderful. But the, the story is get in, get started. Just get started in something, and maybe you start in something, you realize, no, I don't like single-family homes. I like duplexes, or I, I started an office building. I really want to do houses. Great. You know, but just get started. So many people, like, get ready forever, and they never actually get started. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, you know, we have something called the life benefits formula because we know that if people will follow it, they can build a sustainable wealth system that will sustain them through life. And it, it has to do with work. We all have to work to make this happen. We all have to have a mutual respect for others. I'm just listening to you tell your story you had respect for all those bankers that were telling you no, and you listened to them, you learned from them, then you respected yourself enough to do something about it, and you got educated. And all of that is good, but none of it would have gone forward if you hadn't had faith that the future could be better than what today is. Is that right? That's well, well put. And so yeah. our faith has so much to do with whether we take action or whether we don't take action. And so today, I hope that uh, having Dr. Steve Hirsch check on has been an inspiration to you to realize that you got to work hard, you got to respect others, you got to respect yourself, you got to get the education, and you have to have faith that the future can be better than what we're experiencing today. That's right. You know, earlier you mentioned that you were you were grateful for the teaching that we've been able to provide, the policies that we designed for you. And you know what came to my mind as you were saying that? You know, we're serving our Creator. It's one of the ways that we do that, and it's uh, such a blessing to have been a small part of what you're able to accomplish and to see the success that you're experiencing. Uh, It's an amazing blessing. Thanks for joining us on the show today. Any last words you'd like to leave us with? Uh, Thanks for having me, guys. It's been an honor to share with you and and your listeners, and uh, I I just consider this a a privilege to be a part of what you're doing, and um, yeah, I just thank you for the opportunity. All right. Thank you. We'll um, appreciate you sharing your time with us. You are listening to Wealth Talks with the McBees. We'll be back again next week.